there are many reasons why a birth mother cannot parent her child. For mine, it was mental illness. And my father felt that he could not care for us. He did not tell his family that he even had two children. He kept it a secret. So there's a lot of secrets in adoption and we're still dealing with it today. I had a birth mother reach out to me only a few weeks ago. Her daughter found her and she has three children now and she doesn't know what to do because she never told anyone that she placed a child for adoption. Dear Family is a podcast hosted by Rachel Steinman, a writer, an educator, and a mental health advocate. And Rachel gets us up close and personal, so we feel a strong connection, familiarity, and comfort with her guests. So settle in and join us as we search for true healing and journey with Rachel and her most interesting guests. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Dear Family, the podcast. This is episode number 95. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I am so thrilled that you are here listening to a conversation about the importance of family. And we know that family does not have to be blood related. It can be chosen. It can be through adoption or fostering and Whatever you call it, we know that family is so important. And speaking of what's so important, our mental health is so important. And I'm thrilled to say the more I podcast and as time goes on, more and more people are realizing that it's great and important to talk about our mental health. There's no shame in it. It's just as important as our physical health. And it's very closely tied to our physical health. Remember Ask for help if you need it. Look out for your loved ones. Remember, sometimes the people with the biggest smiles that seem to have it all together are silently suffering. There's no shame in getting help, and it's brave. On that note, I want to say thank you so much for sharing this podcast. It means the world to me. Thank you for subscribing, writing those great reviews, and reaching out. If there's anything I can ever do to support you, please let me know. I would love to be able to do that. I wish you the best. Enjoy this episode. Jeanette Yoff believes family is so much more than our blood relations. Her strong desire to become a trauma-informed psychotherapist with a special focus on adopted and foster care issues began with her own experiences of moving through the foster care system and being adopted. Jeanette lived with her birth family for the first year of her life until she was put into foster care due to her mother's schizophrenia. Her father was not willing to take care of his two young children, and when he later had a new family, he never told them about his previous children, continuing the cycle of secrecy and shame surrounding adoption. After living with a few foster families, Jeanette was adopted at seven and a half years old. And although she feels very lucky to have joined a loving family who adopted more children, she still suffered trauma that led to mental health challenges. In 1999, Jeanette took her New York theater background and wrote a one-woman play about growing up in foster care and adoption called What's Your Name? Who's Your Daddy? And it was later turned into a book and audiobook. With a desire to create what she wished she could have received as a child, she began to work tirelessly to help other families. And now with over 20 years of experience, she provides mental health education and support as a psychotherapist, foster care social worker, clinical director and trainer for the LA County Child and Family Services and the Department of Mental Health. She teaches parents and social workers and therapists all about adoption and foster care challenges, trauma-informed parenting, the impact of pre-adoption trauma, grief and loss, and open adoption. She provides support to adult adoptees that are searching for their long-lost family members as well as assisting them in family reunification. She's a court-appointed reunification expert for the Los Angeles Superior Court in cases involving children at risk for separation. And she's also the executive director and founder of the Celia Center, named after her birth mother, which is a nonprofit support center that meets the critical needs of all those connected by foster care and adoption and all those who serve the community of foster care and adoption in the LA County and beyond. She's just published her first children's book called What is Adoption for Kids? And her YouTube channel, Genetically Speaking with a J, 
is a fabulous resource for adoptive parents, biological parents, adoptees, and anyone looking to learn more about the foster care and adoption challenges and joys. Welcome, Jeanette. I'm so happy to have you on the Dear Family podcast. I have to tell you, I first learned about you through a friend, Meredith Morton, shout out to Meredith, who adopted a gorgeous baby girl in an open adoption. And she's been really vocal about what it means to be an adopted family and have an adoptee. And I reached out asking her if she had anyone she recommended that could help educate me on the adoption process. And she said, you absolutely need to reach out to Jeanette because she is not only a therapist, she's also an adoptee. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here and share the experience of growing up in foster care and I was adopted. This podcast is called Dear Family, and we celebrate our complicated families. I would love for you to start by telling us a little bit about your family and your experience growing up in foster care. I'm originally from New York. I now live in Los Angeles. I grew up with my family. I was born in Manhattan in the 70s, and I stayed with my family for the first 15 months of my life. My father worked for New York Telephone. My mother was actually from Argentina. She had a work visa to be a dancer, and she was a dancer in Buenos Aires, and she had a dance company. This was the 70s. The arts in Manhattan was booming. She met my father, had me, and then she had significant stress during her second pregnancy. I do have a brother. but We didn't grow up together, and I was placed in the foster care system due to her significant stress. She was not well mentally. And I did find out later that my mother was diagnosed with schizophrenia. She had been hospitalized. And I went into the foster care system at the age of 15 months and remained there until the age of seven and a half. People always ask, why were you in the system for that long? Well, foster care is about reunification with your biological family. The agency I was placed in had to do their due diligence and find family members that possibly would take care of me and then my newborn brother, who also ended up in the foster care system. We were supposed to go back to Argentina, live with our birth family, could not happen. There was a lot of red tape. And so we remained in the States and then the agency searched for a permanent family for me. So I was placed in another family at the ripe age of seven and a half, and then I was adopted. What about your father and did your brother get adopted by the same family? So my brother was placed in another family in the Bronx. I went to Long Island, New York. They didn't keep siblings together at that time. I'm a big advocate now, keeping siblings together. We only met as adults. Our father did not feel that he could parent two children under the age of three. Uh, He worked full time. He really felt that we needed a mother. And so he actually relinquished his rights and asked Jewish childcare to find us a family. And so we were raised in different families and he was adopted by another family. But I did meet him when I was six and a half because we were supposed to go to Argentina and live with an aunt and uncle. And we had passports made. I remember looking at him and going, is that my brother? Because we look alike. And the social worker explained to me who he was. And I was six and a half meeting my brother for the first time. Remember, I was separated from my birth mother while she was pregnant with him. And then we never saw each other again. So I always knew I had a brother out there. And it wasn't until we were adults that he searched for me for four years and found me. And we had reunion on top of the Empire State Building. And so there's so much more to the story. He found our birth father, wrote him a letter. I found our birth father also previous to my brother finding me, and my birth father would not write me back. And I even called him and he hung up on me. And that was really painful for me as a young adult. And that's when I entered therapy, trying to make sense of all of this. And it's no wonder I'm a therapist today, because I know this experience inside and out as a child and also as an adult, figuring out how do I integrate my birth history? And who are they? I want to know my ancestral roots and genetic 
influences and just wanting to have a relationship, not seeking a father figure, but we want just someone we can reach out to that is part of our birth history, our ancestral heritage. There's many adoptees struggling today with search and reunion because birth parents are not prepared. They don't know how to have conversation. They don't know how to integrate that child back into their life as adults now that they may have other children. There are many reasons why a birth mother cannot parent her child. For mine, it was mental illness. And my father felt that he could not care for us. And last piece to this, he did not tell his family that he even married an Argentinian woman and had two children. He kept it a secret. So there's a lot of secrets in adoption and we're still dealing with it today. I had a birth mother reach out to me only a few weeks ago. Her daughter found her and she has three children now and she doesn't know what to do because she never told anyone that she placed a child for adoption. You can run, but you can't hide anymore with DNA tests. People will find each other and Facebook. We need more support in this area. So incredibly fascinating. Jeanette, you are the perfect person for this podcast, because we talk about family secrets and we talk about mental health and the burden and the stigma and the shame that comes with it and how important it is to talk openly. Tell us about being adopted at seven years old. I was seven and a half and adopted into a Jewish family. The foster home that I was living with was also a Jewish foster home. So I was already going to shul then. I was placed with the agency Jewish Child Care. I was bat mitzvahed at the age of 13. I went to Hebrew school. We went to shul on Saturdays. We were kosher on high holidays. Uh, I was raised Jewish, and I have great respect for the Jewish community, the values, the traditions, and it's still with me today. I don't practice today. I don't go to shul. I have some Jewish guilt about that. And it's interesting because my husband's Unitarian and we've questioned, how do we want to raise our child? We're of many faiths. We're open, but we were not practicing at this time. We do celebrate Hanukkah, Yom Kippur, Passover. So certain holidays we do celebrate. So it sounds more cultural. More cultural. When you were adopted... Were there other siblings in the family? I was the first child that my family adopted. And then we adopted an infant who was born drug exposed. And I remember picking him up at Jewish childcare and they said, watch your new baby brother in the back seat. And he's rolling because they didn't have car seats. This is the seventies. And he's rolling in the little baby bed in the back of the rabbit car. And I'm going, oh my gosh, is he going to be okay? (laughs) And then we fostered another child who was actually reunified with her mother. And we would take her to her visits. And I was about 11 at this time. And I remember watching her have a visit with her mother. And I started questioning, where's my mother? And is, oh, is she going to come back for me? Because when I was adopted, my mom said, you would always ask us, when are you going to give me away? Because I didn't understand that I was actually adopted. No one explained it. I just thought, okay, I'm in a new home and here I am. And I don't know for how long because the past two homes I left. So when she was reunified with her mother, I really started to question. And that's when I started to have significant mental health challenges. And unfortunately, I did attempt to end my life at the age of 13. And I was terribly confused And that's when I entered therapy at the age of 13. And thank God I did, because then we did some family therapy. And then I could really start making sense of what happened to my birth family and why do I feel this way? I felt there was such a big part of me that was missing. And I looked very different. I was what's called transculturally adopted. My father was Jewish. My mother was German. And I didn't know at the time. I was half Argentinian. And my birth father's Irish, American. And I was born into Roman Catholicism and raised in a Jewish family. So I was very confused. (laughs) Who am I? And I had all these different influences. And then we also adopted a sister who was six years old when we adopted her. And she experienced abuse. And my parents had to explain to me. And I was 
13. And that was surprising to me because I was learning, oh, my brother was drug exposed. My sister was abused. And what happened to my mother? Because nobody told me the story. They said she had a lot of stress and she couldn't parent you. I feel lucky to be adopted at the age of seven and a half because my mother received another call from the agency before she received the call about me. We have an infant because families wanted babies. And then they call back and they said, and by the way, we also have this little girl. She's seven years old who also needs a family. And it always cheers me up because my mom says, I couldn't stop thinking about you and what was going to happen to you. So in the 70s, it really wasn't heard of that older kids were adopted. And today it's prevalent. There's more children who are old, hard to place who do need homes. So I'm always saying, please consider adopting an older child. We need stability. We need a family. We need a place to call home and feel a sense of belonging because our past feels so distant. We don't know where we belong. How heartbreaking that at 13, you tried to take your life. That really makes me so sad. Sounds like your parents were very enlightened to put you in therapy. You've dedicated your life to helping others. And you're a psychotherapist who provides mental health education and support as a foster care social worker and as a clinical director and trainer for Los Angeles County Child and Family Services. This is a pretty self-evident answer, but I'm still going to ask it. Why are you so passionate about teaching parents and social workers and therapists about adoption and foster care and the challenges that they're going to face? When I moved to Los Angeles, I was writing about my story and I started volunteering and working with adopted children. I could see that parents weren't understanding the inner life of us because just because we're not actively talking about it does not mean that we're not actively thinking about it because we think deeply about our unfinished business, our past, our ancestors, where we come from. I had a Bachelor of Fine Arts and went to Pace University in Manhattan. And I was strongly thinking, I, I have a voice and I have an expertise and understanding in this area. I want to go back to school I want to work with children and families. And so I got my degree in clinical psychology. I then did an internship at a foster care family agency in Los Angeles. And I really wanted to understand the system. And it was wonderful for me because I could work side by side with county social workers. I worked closely with foster families. I would go into the home. I'd find out why the child was removed. I would help the family understand what we're doing here. It's about family reunification. It's about supporting the birth family, doing their case plan, getting their lives back on track. Because the number one reason why a child is placed in the foster care system is due to an unsafe situation in their home, whether that's domestic violence, abuse, neglect, or witnessing domestic violence, or a drug and alcohol addiction, which is the number one reason why children are in the system. I could see the big picture. And I was also monitoring visits with children and their birth parents. And I would sit there and think, I was like this child, because I also learned that I had many visits with my birth mother and birth father upon entering foster care. So I would observe, watch, and listen, be an owl, and just take it all in. And I would support the birth mother because mothers are not supported well in the foster care system. There's a lot of stigma that they cause this, they're the problem. And a lot of foster parents do become foster parents because they want to adopt and they're not wanting to support the child returning back. And then there are some that do, but there's a lot of challenges. People coming into the system with their own agenda. And we all come into the system as workers to change the system. I meet many social workers who are also adoptees. We're trying to, as adults now, change the system, make a difference, do something different for the next generation so they don't endure the same pain and grief and loss that we have. I then took it upon myself to create therapeutic interventions with children because I would go into the child's home and the parents were like, you need to fix my child. And I said, whoa, hold on. We need to do this together. 
Your child needs your support. They need the attachment. They need you to help understand and join with their grief and loss. They can't process this by themselves. So I started creating tailored interventions, therapeutic interventions, just for this population. There were only a few books at that time. And I actually wrote a book in 2009 groundbreaking interventions, working with traumatized children, teens, and families in foster care and adoption, and creating interventions like the question box, just putting all the questions that the child has about their story in a box, and we're going to answer them one by one, creating a family tree that includes the birth family story and the family that's raising them now. Adopted children don't come to you with a blank slate. They come with the full history that needs to be acknowledged and also providing psychoeducation to children on grief and loss and helping parents be trauma-informed, attachment-informed, because you cannot parent a child who's been separated from their family of origin or placed in multiple foster placements, the same that you would parent a non-adoptee or non-foster child. They need a different approach. I'm passionate because I also think back to my own childhood. I always go, what did I need? Well, yep, I needed this. Let's do this intervention. So from my own experience, I've really just pulled the work. I consider myself creative therapist, experiential therapist, pulling from my experience, kind of like Carl Jung did, because we learn when we can go back and repair our own losses. And as a therapist, I'm very aware of separating my past from my client's past. They have their own story. There's many similar themes that need to be addressed. Do you see adoption as trauma? And what is trauma-informed parenting? When a baby is abruptly separated from their mother at birth, which is often the case, that is considered a life-altering event and a traumatic experience for the baby. Because babies form attachments to their mothers in the womb. They know her for nine months. They know her smell. They know her voice. They know her rhythms. It's hard for parents to hear this. What happens is baby gets placed into the adoptive parent's arms. And there's misattunement. And the baby will have a physiological reaction because it's unfamiliar. I don't smell what's familiar. I don't hear what's familiar and the rhythms aren't familiar. So parents do need to be aware that your child is experiencing a life, your infant, and even toddlers like myself. I cried for three days when I was separated from my mother. My foster family told me three days. I was grieving. So babies are grieving. So to be trauma informed means to be attuned and be aware of your infant, toddler, child's seven nonverbal cues, their eyes, the way they're looking at you, their facial expressions. How are they crying? Are they crying a grief cry, needing security, needing you to be there, not leaving them in the crib? Babies need to be held a lot, especially upon separation. They can't have the cry it out method It doesn't work for them. They feel more isolated, more alone. They they need the co-regulation of the parent to help co-regulate their nervous system. So the parent really needs to work on being responsible for their own reactivity, their own triggers, working on their own regulation and being aware of the child's cues, tone of voice, their body language, how fast or slow they're moving and their gestures. Because children do communicate non-verbally. So to be trauma-informed, you're always looking at the non-verbal cues. You're being aware of your non-verbal cues as well and what you're communicating. Because if you're communicating distress to the baby, the baby is then going to become distressed and not know how to self-regulate. So I do many trainings. I have many videos on my YouTube channel about how to be an attachment-informed and trauma-informed parent. I think someone, and me included, thinks if a baby is taken from his or her mom 
hours after she's given birth, then they're less likely to feel that trauma, but they form an attachment in the womb. Can you explain to the listeners what open adoption is? It is a form of adoption in which the birth family, family of origin, and the adoptive family have access to varying degrees of each other's personal information and contact, whether by mail, phone calls, or visits. And then an open adoption agreement can be put in place, a structure of what it will look like every three months, we will exchange letters, or every six months, we will have a visit, or every week, we will visit. Really, it's about the openness and the relationship that has been formed between the birth family and the adoptive family, and the level of comfort and trust, and having the same objectives and goals. Because open adoption is actually healthy and helps the mother with her grief and loss. And children, studies have found, are not confused. They know the reason why they couldn't live with their birth family. They still see them. They're a part of their life. It actually builds higher self-esteem, confidence, healthy identity development, and less mental health issues. I'm always advocating, why not do open adoption? It's going to help your child adjust and understand and not live with this not knowing. And that's ambiguous loss is really difficult for children to contain psychologically. It really is the hardest. And if not contained and not processed, it can become traumatic grief and loss. And your child can have traumatic grief reactions. So open adoption is best practice today. Are you seeing that more and more as time goes on? Yeah, I facilitate a lot of open adoptions. Oh, great. I definitely see the benefits of it. I can understand why potentially the adopted parents would maybe be nervous about it initially. But for example, I'm seeing Meredith's beautiful relationship and how it's totally benefiting her daughter. How do you provide support to adult adoptees who are searching for their long lost family members? And what type of support do you provide when it comes to family reunification? When I became a therapist and thought of there's many other adult adoptees out there like me. So I started a support group in 2009 called the Adopt Salon Support Group. I wanted to take the sting out of support groups and, and bring us all together. So I bring together birth parents, foster parents, adoptive parents, adult adoptees, foster youth alumni, and we talk together to understand each other's point of view. So after starting that support group, I then began to think about, wow, our community needs more support. So I started a nonprofit organization called Celia Center. It's based in greater Los Angeles. And we have more support groups now. We have adult adoptee-only support groups. We're starting our male adoptee support group next month. We have teen adopt salon support groups and the Constellation Support Group. We talk about search and reunion, how to write a letter, how to make a call, how to make contact, how to have a successful reunion. And we also connect adoptees with genealogists who can help find their long lost family members by helping them create their family tree, which can be very complicated on Ancestry DNA. We also have Celia Center Arts Festivals. And I named my organization Celia Center after my birth mother, Celia. I found out later that she was an artist and a dancer. I did not know this until I was 35. And when I saw photos of her, I said, I want to integrate the arts and adoption because a lot of this experience is pre-verbal. We don't have words for it. And art can do that. We can put the experience into pictures feel and know what the images are to help make sense. We have Celia Center Arts Festivals now and adoptees can contribute their art. And there are many adoptees in the artists community and performers, poets, to be able to have a place, the expressive arts, to share your story in the way you feel safe and comfortable and transform it into something new so it can be embraced by others. So it's pretty powerful what we've done. We've been around for 10 years. That's amazing. I will have a link to the Celia Center in the show notes. What happens when an adoptee finds out who a birth parent is through 
maybe Ancestry or 23andMe, and they reach out to their biological parent and they want nothing to do with them. How do you counsel them? Because it sounds like that's happened to you when you called your dad. That's got to be like a stab in the heart. It's very, very painful. And that can cause more mental health issues because it feels like a second rejection. Even though the birth parent may have made a plan for adoption, doesn't mean they rejected them, but it feels that way. It's invalidating of who we are and where we come from. It's like your tribe rejects you. And so we have to honor the grief and the loss first and foremost. And we're not comfortable in our society to just be with that loss. Grieving is going through these stages of grief. You're going to be in denial, like, oh, is this really happening? You're going to be angry and you're going to feel guilty. Should I have done this? Should I not have done this? Now I just opened a can of worms. And you're going to grieve, feel depressed, sad about this, and then learn to accept a little dose at a time. And also what happens for us is we can get stuck in what's called a narcissistic wound where it becomes all about us. But what we really need to do is go and let me think about her or my birth father, my birth mother's life, my birth father's life, and what is going on in them. So I do say to adoptees, when your family cannot have reunion, it's not a rejection of you personally. It is a reflection of the circumstances in their life at that time and their inability to process their grief and loss. Because let me tell you, they were not supported. And most of them are told, get over this, forget this ever happened. I even had a social worker, I'm shocked today, tell a foster family the parental rights were terminated and the social worker turned to the parents and said, you can rip up her number now. No, no, you're going to hold on to her number because birth parents need support. They are grieving. They have their own trauma. So it's not a rejection of us. We need to step back and go, okay, they're having an experience too. It's not all about me. And there's reasons why a birth parent cannot see you, know you. And what I've really sat and thought about, my birth father, I know he loved me. It's way too painful for him to see me. He has so much guilt and he's had no mental health support. So I can't expect him to be able to do it like I'm doing it because I've had so much support. I obviously cannot relate to that, but I have family trauma. And when I was able to write and see my family members as 3D full characters, I was able to find compassion and forgive. And that is been so incredibly helpful. Yes, it's so painful, but you have to understand where this person is coming from. And maybe if you can find that, then you are able to let some of that anger and pain diminish. You're a court appointed reunification expert for the LA Superior Court in cases involving children at risk for separation. How do you best assist a child? I'm usually hired by a family attorney and It's usually from an estranged parent who wants to be in their child's life and have a relationship with that child. And they may be estranged for many reasons. Divorce, they weren't married at the time. They didn't know how to incorporate the child in their lives. Maybe one parent was living in one state, one parent was living in another state, adoption. And so I provide guidance to the parents on child development. I help them understand the mental health needs in reunification. And then I create a reunification plan, which involves therapy sessions for the child first to help them understand and set a structure and a foundation for them to learn. Because I'll tell you, a lot of cases that come to me, they don't even know they have this parent out there because they're assuming the parent they're living with is their parent and they're not their biological father. I tend to have a lot more fathers wanting reunification because they've been estranged for these numerous reasons. And so education, allow the child to process their own feelings. And I do a lot of the similar interventions that I do with adopted children, and they may not be adopted, but we do a step-by-step process following the child's need and helping them learn and helping the parent understand how to follow the child's need so they can build a healthy 
relationship with each other and get to know each other and not wait until they're adults. It's really allowing them this process of having a healthy reunion, which is healthy for their development. I'm going to ask you a question that's a controversial topic and please feel free to not answer it if you don't feel comfortable. But do you believe that adoption is a solution to abortion? No, I do not. It's not that magical remedy for the increase in unwanted pregnancies because the painful experience of separating from your family of origin contributes to significant mental health issues for that child their whole lives. And the trauma is not acknowledged by our society. It still isn't considered disenfranchised grief. People are confused. My foster family is confused. When I ask them, I want to know about my birth family. They go, let it go. You don't want to know. Excuse me. That's my life. That's my story. And so the significant mental health issues, I'm going to give you some statistics. 12 to 14% of adopted children in the United States between the ages of 8 and 18 are diagnosed with a mental health disorder each year. And adopted children are almost twice as likely as children brought up with their biological parents to suffer from mood disorder, anxiety, depression, behavioral challenges, as well as eating disorders, oppositional defiance, ADHD, post-traumatic stress reactions, grief and loss, and attachment challenges. We have significant mental health issues, and it places a strain on our mental health system. Adopted children in the United States constitute 2 to 3% of the population, but they compromise approximately 16.5% of the population in residential treatment centers, and the numbers are rising. One of my clients just went into residential treatment. I've had more than a handful of my clients because they need daily intervention. They're overwhelmed. They don't know how to make sense of this. And adoptive parents are overwhelmed and they don't know what to do because no one told them. And I know it doesn't make adoption look pretty. And I talk to parents from my heart and I say, I'm sorry, no one told you that it would be this challenging. I'm so grateful to hear honesty I feel like you cannot make things better or improve things without acknowledging the truth. Thank you for sharing those statistics. Clearly, you're an advocate with your eyes wide open. You're not burying your head in the sand. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about celebrity adoptions because there are many famous celebrity adoptions that are outside of race. So for example, Madonna and Charlize Theron and Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman, Steven Spielberg and Kate Capshaw, Sandra Bullock and Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, just to name a few. I want to know what your thoughts are on transracial adoption, regardless of celebrity. And should adoptive parents recognize an adoptee's first family First, what's challenging with transracial adoption is it's actually more challenging than parenting a child who's similar to you. Many more challenges, challenges of discrimination, racism. People are going to question your family and why you're different. And you're always going to be looked at differently. And I was a huge Madonna fan. She was one of those that said, oh, I don't see color. Parents may not be aware that they are colorblind or race mute. We don't see color. You must embrace the differences when you have a transracial adoptee. They're not the minority in your family. I've had one parent who actually moved to a black neighborhood, white parent, adopted two children of color. He chose, because he recognized his white privilege, he needs to help his child's racial and identity development. He needs to nurture them. That's his responsibility as a parent. And he moved to a black neighborhood. Good for him. And so if we don't acknowledge there is a difference here, then what happens for kids is they don't recognize their blackness and they don't know how to integrate into the black culture. And they get caught in between. Am I white? Am I black? Where do I identify and where do I belong? And even when they go into their Black communities, Black communities recognize their white privilege. They're not like us. So we don't want to be ignorant. We want to acknowledge there's a difference. 
They need that genetic mirroring. They need to be with kids who look like them. I'm a big advocate for open adoption. They do need to see their birth families. It's healthy for them. And also understand racism and how to deal with discrimination because when they're with you, they will be treated differently. When they're not with you, they will be treated differently and they need to be taught how to respond to racism. And it's hard. It's uncomfortable to talk about these issues. Past few years, we're beginning to talk about it, but it's still challenging in our country. And it is a parent's responsibility when parenting a child of a different race to be responsible to supporting, educating your child and integrating their culture and their race into their lives so that when they do go out into the world, they know who they are and they have the right to identify with wherever they choose to identify. I knew one adult adoptee whose parents did not honor her blackness and they were shocked because she moved to Harlem and that scared them, but they didn't do their homework. They didn't help her integrate. It's called reculturation. A lot of adoptees need to go back and live in their community to get to know who they are. It can be shocking for parents when they leave home and they go with their people because they didn't get this growing up and they need it. It's for their psychological health. Appearance is important in families and adoption can be really alienating and lonely, especially if you grow up in a family where everyone looks different than you do. Can you explain why it's important for adoptee parents to assist their adopted children in knowing the truth about their birth and what genetic mirroring is? Genetic mirroring provides a basis of familiarity and and the markers to your cultural, ethnic, and racial roots. If you were adopted by a different culture, ethnic, or racial, you don't receive the daily dose of genetic markers, which help you develop a healthy sense of identity. So when you grow up with your biological family, you have these guideposts. You can see familiar traits with your siblings, your parents, and your personality. When you don't have these guideposts, there are no clues or crumbs to follow. These genetic markers don't exist, which can cause genetic bewilderment for adoptees. Like for me, I could salsa dance. I remember I was not told I was Argentinian. I was confused by that trait, that innate talent. Genetic mirroring is having that reflected back at you, which validates who you are. And it validates your personality type, your temperament. Did you get that from your mother or your father? Your emotional style, your learning style, your gender differences, your talents, your strengths, your weaknesses, and your resilience, all of which help you form healthy identity. If an adoptee doesn't have these markers, it actually holds them back from developing themselves. My mother, when I had reunion with her, which I did, I finally found her and flew to Argentina. She did this little thing with her mouth. She would like stick her tongue in the side of her cheek. And I looked and I went, I do that, that little genetic marker. Now I know where that comes from because I didn't know, is this just a genet thing or is this a oh, this is a genetic thing. And also the dancing. I could dance. I had this innate talent and my parents didn't know how to nurture it. They were not dancers. And when I learned she was a dancer, I went, had I known, maybe I would have become a dancer. But these little nuances that help us understand ourselves better, it's important. It matters deeply. I have a daughter who is very musically talented. And people always ask me, where did she get that from? I find it fascinating to think that artistic talents can be genetic. Tell us about this reunion with your mom. It was 10 years in the making. So after my brother and I met on top of the Empire State Building, he had a photo of her. And the first time I saw her, and I looked just like her. It was striking, which triggered my grief and loss. And then we decided together to search for her. And so we created a page on Yahoo searching for Celia. It had been up there for 10 years. A boyfriend of my aunt's was looking up pirates in the Barbosa family. My mother's maiden name is Celia Barbosa. And he looks up 
searching for Celia Barbosa or something. And up comes this page, searching for Celia. He calls over my aunt and says, oh my goodness, who, who is this? My aunt screams and says, oh my God, that's Jeanette and Patrick is my brother. Those are Celia's children. They didn't even know what had happened to us when we weren't returned to Argentina. She then wrote my brother, there was an email and said, we are your family. And there's a lot of adoption scams out there. So my brother didn't believe it. And he said, I need you to give me some identifying information so I know who you are. And she gave her birth date, her name, that she lived in New York City. It was confirmed it was her. We learned that she, our birth mother was living in Argentina. She had been deported after having two children in the foster care system back to Argentina and was then hospitalized. And she had been living in a state-run women's institution for mental health uh, for, at that point, 20 years, because we were in our 20s. This was in July of 2002. And my brother and I flew down there in December, celebrated her 70th birthday. And uh, we learned we had an older half sister as well. Same mother, different father who was living in Argentina. And so we had a reunion with her. It was challenging because she was diagnosed with schizophrenia. So she would tell people stories and you didn't know what was real, what was true. But she had all these fantasy stories about living in New York City and being a dancer. And she hung out with Andy Warhol and Jimi Hendrix at this place called Maxis's Kansas City, which is where all the beatniks and artists hung out in the 70s. And she shared the story of the day that she brought me to Jewish childcare. It was very painful because she said to me, you were kidnapped. And for me, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. now what's happening but then I really had to just separate, is this real? And this is her experience. And she's been traumatized. And maybe her coping mechanism with a story to protect herself. Exactly. We don't know. Our father, he's still alive. He has the story. I'm just hoping one day he will sit down and tell us what happened, please. Just so we know we can handle it. We're adults now. But it was beautiful amazing. I got to meet so many of my cousins, aunts, and uncles, learning about my Argentinian cultural roots and being there. And I just really felt, wow, these are my people. I saw people that look like me, the same skin color. And people assumed I spoke Spanish because I looked Argentinian. You had the genetic mirroring. <laughs> exactly. I got such chills hearing that. I'm, was, I'm glad you got that experience. What are primal wounds? The term primal wound was coined by an adoptive mother who wrote the book, The Primal Wound by Nancy Verrier. It means the abyss of the pain of separation when a mother and child are separated shortly after childbirth. It has no rhyme or reason and it's extremely painful and it sticks with us our whole lives. And we can regress back to primal feelings and feel very infantile and overwhelmed and confused. So healing that is processing your story, writing your story, seeking reunion, having a psychotherapist with you, being in support groups, being with other adoptees so you're not alone in this process, and to grieve that primal wound because it's a part of you. And it will shrink in its intensity, frequency, and duration as you nurture it and have compassion with yourself and with your birth parents. What are the seven cores of adoption? The seven core issues, I didn't originate them, come from a woman who's been in the field for 40 years, Sharon Rosia, and she developed them with Deborah Silverstein, and they were adoptive and foster parents. The first one is loss. All adoption starts with a form of loss. Then rejection guilt and shame, grief, identity, intimacy, and a sense of mastery and control. These are core themes for adoptees and birth parents and adoptive parents. It affects all members of the constellation. I have learned so much from going on your YouTube channel, which you call Genetically with a J, which is such a perfect name. And it's a really great resource. And I'll have the link in the show notes. You wrote a one woman show about growing up in foster care and adoption. And it's called, what's your name? Who's your daddy? 
another great name. And it's now available in paperback on Amazon. And again, link in the show notes. Tell us about the one woman show. When I moved to Los Angeles, I was dating a writer and he learned about my story and he knew I had a Bachelor of Fine Arts. I did a lot of theater in New York and theater is about telling stories. And so I wrote one scene about a little girl who's seven and she goes on an audition and she brings her headshot out. And the auditioner starts asking her questions about what foods do you like to eat? What experience do you have? She'll say things like, well, I lived in this one family and I could be a really good daughter because I've had a lot of experience and I know how to ride a bike. I know how to tie my own shoelaces. I know how to cut my own hair. I will eat whatever they want me to. You see this little girl auditioning for a family and the desperation in that, her wanting to get the role of a daughter. I, I don't know where, I just had this kid part of me that just came out and this little kid voice and I'm talking and I'm doing all this. And I, and I said, wow, this is really cathartic for me. And in doing that, I wrote a whole one woman show talking about the experience from the child's point of view three years ago, recorded it on Audible. So you can now listen to it. It sounds like a performance. It has sound cues. And I loved doing this again. And now there are foster and adoptive families listening to it in support groups across the country and really helping parents understand what it feels like, that internal world, because that's what I speak to. And, and just the question of who I am and where do I come from and the search for self. That's Celia coming through, the performer in you. You've also just written a new children's book called What is Adoption? Tell us about that. During the pandemic, as it affected us all, I had to shut down my office. I felt separated from children and I decided I want to work more on my YouTube channel. Parents were coming to me. I haven't told my child they were adopted. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to create a little animation. And then realized, wow, I have a children's book. So I turned it into a children's book and I explained to kids, what is adoption? What are the many reasons that any child may not stay in their birth family so that they can help identify, oh, yep, that's my story. And then how you're going to feel about that. You're going to have grief and loss. You're going to have questions. So a few of my therapeutic interventions are in the book. And it's also teaching parents and allowing this dialogue and this conversation to happen. And helping kids know that they're not alone, that there are almost 7 million adoptees across the country. I bring in some statistics, celebrities who are adopted, and letting them know you matter, you're not alone, you're valuable, and you're going to get through this. You're going to have big feelings, and here are things you can do about that. So I'm just so thrilled. And Meredith's daughter, she took a picture of her holding the book, and I saw that picture and went, oh my goodness. This is my dream come true, helping kids understand what's happened to them and why. I just I'm sure so as a little girl, you would have loved to have had that resource. I have an intern working for me. She just translated it into Spanish and I'll be publishing a Spanish version because there's many Spanish families and there's not enough Spanish resources. So I'm so happy to be doing that now. So amazing, truly. We've talked about some of the, these statistics that are a bit scary about the higher rate of suicide and drug addictions among adoptees, but there are also numerous incredible joys for both adoptees and adoptive parents. What are the joys? Just being able to parent a child who does not have a family and provide them with loving home, security, and mattering, it means so much to us. Children need to be loved and matter to someone and for their mental health, for their physical health, for their development. And to make a difference in a child's life, that is the greatest feeling, the greatest gift. All my families have mattered to me. You're important. You're giving a child a second chance at life. I was lucky to be adopted. And there are so many foster youth who become teenagers who are never adopted and they don't have a place to turn to. They don't have a place to call home and they don't know where they belong. And so they go through life 
with so much ambiguity and so many more mental health issues. Just being there for a child is everything and more. And to love a child and yeah, it's going to be hard sometimes, but to provide fun memories, experiences, provide them with an education so they can break whatever the stigma was in their birth family's lives. I mean, you could be changing a whole future for that child. So it matters. And, and it's, it's rewarding and a gift to you. How can someone get involved in the foster care system if they're interested? You can contact your local Department of Children and Family Services. You can become a certified foster parent. There are different variables of foster parenting. You can be a respite foster parent. You provide support to foster families. You can become an emergency placement where babies are placed when they're first removed from their families because they need to find a safe place for that child to be while the social worker is searching for a more permanent placement. You can also be what's called a you can also be what's called a court appointed special advocate. That's called a CASA. Each state has child and family court system. And so what a CASA does is they advocate for the child's needs, emotional, mental, educational, so that someone's advocating because a lot of the times children fall through the cracks in the system. There's no one person following them through, could be multiple foster homes. There's no one that knows that child. So you can be a mentor, an advocate, follow a child through their placements so that they have that one person because that one person does provide what's called that seed of resilience. And when we have someone looking out for us, we will gain more confidence, more self-esteem and have a place and person to turn to. That's the resilience factor. And if you also know a foster parent who's fostering, you could say, hey, I'll babysit because foster parents need a lot of support. I'm going to ask you the last two questions I ask all my guests. If you could write your younger 20-year-old self a Dear Jeanette love letter, knowing what you know now, what would you tell yourself? I didn't believe in myself then. Jeanette, you can believe in yourself. You're not a piece of garbage. I know you felt that way many times. You were loved from the beginning. You are loved and you will continue to be loved. They couldn't parent you, not because of you, because of the circumstances in their life at that time. They tried. It just couldn't work out. You're lovable. You do matter and you will matter and you will be doing amazing things. So trust yourself. I know you feel helpless, hopeless, and powerless sometimes but tap into your creativity and resilience. You can make something out of nothing. Don't ever give up. Stay creative, stay curious, and believe in yourself. Even if your voice cracks, speak anyway. And I've been doing that for a long time. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. Think about all the children that are with you that you're speaking up for because you can help the next generation and you can be a difference in the system. So keep on, keep marching on, go for it. I love it. You are speaking up for so many other kids, a children's book alone, the power in that. Do you have any happiness habits? What brings you joy? Oh yeah. Well, I have five cats. I just love cats. They're therapeutic for me. They actually help me turn on. When I stop working, I rest with my cats and I, I, I listen to their purring. I really connect with them. It helps me just shift creativity. I I am a brainstorm addict. I have so many ideas for so many things. It gets me excited. And so I write it down. I may do something. I may not, but I just get excited by the thought of possibilities, which actually I think for me just keeps the spark going and I have something to look forward to. And of course, I love being funny and doing funny things with my husband and son. I try not to take myself so seriously. I love comedy. I watch a lot of comedy. And I say some funny comedy things. And I love it. Be silly. Don't take yourself so seriously. And laugh. Laughing is therapeutic in and of itself. Absolutely. And it's good for your abs. 
but I realized I didn't talk about your current family. Can you tell us a little bit about your current family? I married my husband after I joined the theater company and we have one son. He's biological. He's 15 now. And my father still lives in New York. My adoptive mother did pass away in 2018, which is very painful. And my birth mother did pass away in 2014. I go back to New York every year with my family, with my father. And my husband's family lives in Massachusetts. We spend time with them. And my half-sister, Sylvina, lives in Spain. And my brother, Patrick, lives in New Zealand. So I have family all around the world. I have to travel and live a good, blessed life. I am grateful for my family. Family is everything. But family doesn't have to be blood related. We can have chosen family. Yeah. And my Celia Center community has become a family. We have affected so many people's lives, impacted so many people for 10 years now in Los Angeles. So I have so many adoptive parents that I'm friends with and adoptees and created this community. Family is more than blood. feel blessed that I could do this work. I want to thank you so much. This has been such an honor and my privilege to have this time to speak with you. I've learned so much and there's just no doubt you're helping so many families. Thank you, Rachel. What a great podcast you have. It's fantastic. Thank you. Keep up the good work, sharing stories of family. Absolutely. I really appreciate it. So lovely seeing you on Zoom, your beautiful face. And I hope to meet you in person. Thank you. You take care. Bye. This is Rachel Steinman. For more information or to contact me with any questions, comments, or guest ideas, please check out rightnowrachel.com. That's right with a W. Thank you so much for listening, subscribing, and sharing, dear family. And if you found value in what you've just heard, I would love and so appreciate a great review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, I wish you love, happiness, and good mental health.